Thank you very much. Uh, so, I'm here to talk about solar-powered vehicles. It's been 132 years since the first production automobile created by uh, Carl Benz. It was the motor car. It was the first vehicle that really you could produce multiple times and it would be reliable and people could drive around every day. 132 years of technological advancements in all industries and everything uh, from space, from materials, from um, medical and everything like that, that we've made all these advancements, but we haven't made any changes to the way we look at transportation. We use it the same way. We sit in a car. We're the ones controlling it. We use internal combustion engines still, um, and that's our primary means. So why are we stuck? Why are we stuck on this one type of vehicle? And yes, we've made modifications and made it safer. It's enclosed. Uh, we have air conditioning now inside these you know, contained spaces, but really not a whole lot else has been done. There are two, over 250 million vehicles on the roads in the US today. Only 550,000 of them are electric vehicles, meaning 99% of all vehicles on the road today are polluters, contribute to CO2, um, commit you know, a lot of uh, hydrocarbon burning and extraction from the ground that ultimately affect the way we live day to day. It affects our health, it affects the way um, we see the world, it affects how we transport ourselves. So, what can be done about it? Well, let me start back from where I saw it. So, early on in my educational career, I, I kind of started doing a lot of research in a lot of different fields, but this is the one that got me stuck. So right now, of roughly a third of all CO2 emissions come from the transportation sector. That is a huge chunk of that overall pie and something that, honestly, I felt like a lot of people were not looking at intently enough. You know, everybody looks at the energy sector, the industries, and how they're, you know, using energy and where they're coming from non-renewables. Well, how can we change the transportation sector? What makes that even worse is, again, all of our fuels for transportation come from hydrocarbons, from petroleum, from natural gas, things like that, things that contribute directly to CO2 emissions and climate change. So what can we do about it? Well, I don't know why I do this to myself, but I feel like every time I'm inspired by something, I have to take on a big project. So um, very early on, I got inspired by one of my professors to take on a project. And what we did was decide to build a solar powered vehicle. Now this first vehicle was kind of a Frankenstein of a bunch of different parts, uh, really slapped together to try and just make it work and see you know, if it was possible, to see if students could actually build something uh, that could run off the sun. So we took a golf cart, it's actually three different golf carts, a Harley Davidson, a club car, and uh, I believe an, uh, an eco car, all pieced together to make this one solar charged electric vehicle. Now again, this was just a proof of concept. So over the next couple years, we you know, went back through the iterations, we're designing, building, uh, coming up with something that we could actually see on the roads, something that is 100% solar powered. And it's this funny looking car here. <laughs> now, a lot of people look at it and say, is, is that a spaceship? Is, is that a boat? You know, what, what is this thing? It's not until we can actually get it driving down the road that people look at it and say, wow, this is amazing. I can't believe this car is driving, uh, and it's driving 100% off the sun. It can travel at 45 miles an hour, 100% powered by the sun, and uses less power than your standard hair dryer. Now, this is a funny looking car. It's not something that you see as a practical use everyday driver. Not something that you necessarily you know, want to get in and out of, because I can attest to you, you need to be a little bit of an acrobat to get in and out of that thing. <laughs> but we took it to a few international races. And I le we learned a lot, obviously, you know, the team learned a lot about how to work with each other. We learned a lot about the technology, but there's one thing that really stuck with me, is driving a solar car is a lot like riding a bike. Uphills are terrible, they suck. You just go as slow and chug up them as, as best you can, but overall, it's very difficult to do. But going downhill in a hyper aerodynamic, very efficient vehicle is like riding and bombing down a hill on a bike, going as fast as you can, just basically screaming we the whole way down. 
But, you know, why, why don't we think of bicycles or think of human powered transportation when we think of these bigger vehicles? You know, why don't we think of how can we make the roadways more efficient? How can we make the vehicle more efficient to where we're not using as much, you know, even if it is an electric vehicle, to where we can increase the range, to where we're burning less in an internal combustion engine, to where we're making these changes so that we can make a more efficient form of transportation. So, again, funny looking vehicle, but we proved that it is possible. We took this vehicle at a track, did uh, 600 miles on a track, did almost 2,000 miles on US roadways going to different national parks all across the Midwest, and we proved that it is possible, even on rainy days, to drive this vehicle. But biggest you know, drawback is it's not a very practical vehicle. I mean, where do you go through a drive-through and you know, get, your, get your food, or you know, where do you go and put your groceries when you want to go to the grocery store? It's, it's not very practical. So I started looking at what can we do, what can be made different to make this a more effective form of transportation and still use renewable energy miles to achieve this. So this is a graph by the Rocky Mountain Institute, and they did a lot of research and much more than I was willing to do, so I you know, took some of their data, but we consume two billion barrels of oil a year here in the US. Not to mention the three trillion dollars that consumers spend into the vehicles, into the maintenance, into the amount of gallons you're purchasing at the pump every year. And then of that, of the CO2 we're creating, we're creating 1.5 gigatons of CO2 every single year. That's enough to basically have over 300,000 elephants every single year in CO2 and a gas. It's about 10% of the total U.S. population, the weight of the total U.S. population combined, roughly 10% of the weight. Not to mention how we use our vehicle is probably the most inefficient use of transportation. 95% of our vehicle life is spent parked. 75% of the time we drive, we drive by ourselves. And 38 hours, granted we, we live in a little bit more of a rural area, so it's less for us, but if any of you have lived near a city, you know, that's a very real number for you. 38 hours a year stuck in traffic. So what can we do? So these are the five improvements that I see to personal automobiles that are really gonna make the difference. This is the game changers. This is what is gonna change the face of personal transportation as we see it in the future. So lighter materials, autonomous driving, cheaper and better batteries, solar cell efficiency increasing while reducing the price, and then also vehicles to grid or vehicles to home, which I'll explain in a minute. And out of those, I kind of see them in three different categories. Efficiency improvements, the cost coming down on some of them, and the way we utilize our vehicles, changing the way that we use personal transportation. So, this is an example of uh, two materials that are still based in the lab, but um, I'm really excited for them to finally come out onto the market, because remember, all materials, everything's been tested in a lab or something like that before it's available to everybody else. So the one on the left is a graphene gyroid. It is actually 95% lighter than steel, yet 10 times stronger than steel. So this is a very unique shape that was developed by a mathematician in the 1970s. Um, and basically, it's meant to maximize the amount of air void to lighten it, but also increase the strength of the material altogether. The other one is a micro lattice metal. It's 99% lighter or 99% air, yet just as strong as titanium. It's developed by MIT, um, and it's a very unique structure of a material. But again, if we look at these materials and these lightweight materials, the less our vehicles weigh, the more efficient they are, and the further they can go. Autonomous driving. Now, some of you probably will agree with this right away. When you're driving out on the road, and somebody cuts you off, you're probably cursing at them and saying, how dare you? Well, it's honestly because the human, the person driving the vehicle, is the most inefficient portion of the vehicle. Not to mention, 
we have 32,000 vehicle deaths a year, all coming from humans. It's all driver error that have caused 32,000 deaths a year. So the NTSB chairman has said, if we can make all of our vehicles autonomous, not you know, uh, driver assist, but actually autonomous, running entirely by themselves, we could potentially save 32,000 lives a year here in the US. Now, I know a lot of you don't want to give up the reins. A lot of you don't want to give up on driving your own vehicle. But this is the way of the future to save uh, lives, make vehicles more efficient, and make sure that our entire transportation sector is more efficient. Because as a lot of you may be aware, vehicles like Uber, rideshare, things like that, we're not going to have one person sitting in a car to commute from your home to your place of work. We could fill up this vehicle. We could request a ride. It'll show up at your doorstep, pick you up, take you to your work safely. This is another one. Reducing the cost of energy storage. Tesla has made many leaps and bounds when it comes to this. Less than 10 years ago, the same size battery from a Tesla Powerwall cost $2,000. Today, it costs $350 per kilowatt hour. Tesla is hoping to reduce the cost with their new giga, giga factory to less than $100 per kilowatt hour. Now you think of, you know, everybody I'm sure have, have had the conversation of, well, electric vehicles are expensive. Largely that's because the cost of an electric vehicle goes directly into energy storage, goes directly into their battery. If we can reduce the cost of the battery, then it reduces the cost of the vehicle, making it more appealing for individuals to buy. Plus, if anybody's ever driven an electric vehicle and pressed on the accelerator the entire way, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> There's a lot more torque there, a lot more acceleration. Okay. Um, this is another one, the, the cost of solar. The cost of solar has gone from $77 per watt to less than 30 cents per watt today. Now that's over 40 years. That's gonna continue to decrease year after year until we get to some theoretical limit around 10 to 15 cents per watt. Now the biggest cost of solar right now is the cost to install it. So when you buy a solar system or a PV system and you wanna you know, be 100% off the grid or you want to supplement the amount of energy you're using you're paying for the labor. You're not really paying much for the solar. Solar has actually come to grid parity with all other forms of electricity, meaning solar costs the same amount as a natural gas plant, as a nuclear plant, as a coal manufacturing facility. That was back in 2015. Prices are continuing to drop. Therefore, solar is becoming more and more of an economical option. This is the most important use of a vehicle that I think is really gonna change the way that we use our vehicles. So this is a vehicle to grid or vehicle to home model. So you have this electric vehicle which has energy storage built into it that can easily communicate and work directly with the grid or with your home. Now, everybody knows you go home at the end of the day, you use a lot of energy because you're cooking, you're cleaning, you're, you know, you're, you're taking showers, same thing in the morning, cooking, cleaning, taking showers. But what are you doing in the middle of the day? What are you doing in the evenings? You're usually out and about or you're sleeping. And so there's not as much demand on the grid during those times. There's always demand when you are home, when you're active. These vehicles basically plug directly into the grid, supplement your energy, and then also stabilize the grid at the same time. Same way that utilities are now using batteries as a backup in case you know, a coal plant goes down or something like that. So it's a very important model to look at to help stabilize the grid and also make sure that we're not producing as much electricity when we need to. This is the two really interesting things that happened this year is Panasonic has been partnered with Tesla for years, but they actually produced a solar rooftop for a Prius. Now, the solar rooftop is only available in Japan right now, but they are looking at the potential of bringing it to the US 
Unfortunately, they used, Prius kind of has a small surface area to put solar, so it's not a whole lot. It's only providing about four miles of renewable energy. But there's nothing to say that we can't expand that surface area, expand the area that we're applying solar, and make sure that we take directly from the sun and power directly to the vehicle. Because anytime you transfer energy, anybody that's in physics or any sort of mathematics or something like that, you know anytime you transfer energy, you're losing some of it to something, whether that's thermal or mechanical or chemical, you're losing energy throughout the process. So if you can put solar directly at the primary source, then you have no problems. You're, you're using that energy directly. You're not losing the efficiency in it. Tesla has said on their Model 3 that they're coming out with later this year that they're going to look at also including that as an option for their vehicles. So it's a really exciting year to actually see this technology kind of come to some fruition. Now, all this is great and dandy, but if you can't directly apply all these concepts, all these ideas, and come up with something that is truly going to work and be revolutionary, then you're not changing the face of the game. If you can't prove to the other you know, big three automotive manufacturers that this is possible, this is feasible, then what are they going to do? They're just going to continue with the same model. You're going to continue to drive the same car. You're going to drive it the exact same way you did yesterday. You're not going to try and drive more efficiently. You're not going to try and use a technology that really is you know, at the leading edge of transportation. So here at Appalachia State University, we're in the design process and construction process of a fully solar-powered and electric two-seater car that you see here. Now this car is built for the same ideas for competitions when we move forward. You know, we want to compete against some of the top engineering schools from around the world. But we also made sure to put practicality into our design process. If we didn't think of how could this car be implemented on our roads today, what's the point of designing it? What's the point of building it? So we're designing a car around today's models. So how can we drive it on the roads today? How can we utilize it at home, make sure we can plug in and use it as a battery or as a vehicle to home or vehicle to grid use? So you're doing something a little bit different than just building a car for a competition. Hopefully this is going to be the model to prove that this is a possibility, that it doesn't look like a funny shaped boat or spaceship, something that you can actually, you know, see yourself in. Now, I know what you guys are thinking is, well, maybe we can find some other form of transportation. Maybe we could do something different. Unfortunately, personally owned vehicles aren't going anywhere. We've been doing it for millennia. We've been riding horses by ourselves. We could have done a horse-drawn carriage, but people still see themselves by themselves driving around. So what we have to do is change the way we shape the technology around the driver, around the person operating the vehicle. So this is our vision, and I hope you can see it into the future, and hope you guys can stick around and, and share this exciting time with us as we build it over the next year. Thank you.